Chapter 5 Ramsey The day was bright but blustery, with a strong westerly wind that both billowed the sails and turned the sea wild and unpredictable, tossing anyone that sailed upon it back and forth. That bit of capriciousness was why the first volley of cannonballs collided with the water just shy of the prow, rather than striking the magpie's wing herself. Rathbone, who was at the helm, let out a loud curse and spun the wheel as hard as he could, swinging the bulk of the ship out of the way. A second barrage of deadly iron splashed down to starboard, sending up great waves of spray that drenched everyone and everything on deck. Mercia and Shan were already fumbling with cannonballs of their own, preparing to retaliate, only for Ramsay to burst from the captain's cabin like a wild thing and shout them down. If we try to fire back, they'll scupper us, he bellowed. Rathbone, who had the best view of the enemy vessel, had to agree. Their attacker was of a similar size, with a dark beechwood hull and crimson sails already in a position to launch as many broadsides as it cared to. To return fire, the magpie's wing would have to expose the vulnerable sides of the ship, presenting a bigger target. Their best option now, Rathbone suspected, was to flee. Ramsay, however, had other ideas. Having instructed Shan and Mercia to tilt the sails, he lumbered up the stairs and bade Rathbone to surrender the wheel. Have your sword at the ready, he growled. We'll show these wretches what it means to start a fight with the likes of us. Under his command, the prow of the ship turned in the water and began to speed directly for their enemy. He's going to ram them, Rathbone thought, and dread twisted his guts as he drew his sword. Their assailants had obviously reached the same conclusion, because yet more cannon fire rained down around them. These shots landed even more haphazardly than before, doing little more than rattling the ship's windows, and it was clear that Ramsay's bold scheme had the crew of the other ship in a panic. One final shot arced high overhead before their guns fell silent. They were either out of ammunition, Rathbone suspected, or unwilling to waste any more of it with missed shots. Rathbone risked a look through his spyglass, and could see the opposing crew scrambling around in confusion as the magpie's wing bore down upon them mercilessly. Would their prow be weighty enough to skewer the other vessel, he wondered, leaving them locked like stags, tussling with their antlers? Or would the two vessels simply broach, tipping to the point at which a torrent of seawater would flood into the ships and send both crews to join whatever fell creatures lurked at the bottom of the sea? Suddenly, Ramsay was moving past him. To his horror, Rathbone realized that the furious captain had simply abandoned his position at the wheel, trusting their speed and Mercia's skill to keep them aimed toward their target. He'd moved to the capstan, placing both his hands upon it, and it was only then that Rathbone gained a full understanding of what was going through the man's head. Biting his lip, he took over the helm, ready to go along with what was either a very brave or a very foolish thing to do. The enemy ship was closer now, so close that Rathbone no longer needed a spyglass to see the terrified expression on the other crew's faces. Less than fifty feet now separated them. Now, less than thirty. Now. At the last possible moment, Ramsay heaved on the capstan with all his might, sending the anchor and its long, heavy chain down into the depths. Rathbone wondered briefly if they might be in such deep water that there'd be nothing for the huge weight to catch onto. But then he heard the familiar thud of metal on rock. It was now or never. The magpie's wing groaned in protest, and Rathbone spun the wheel with all his might as they began to pivot. The anchor's chain was at full extension now, and its pull was transforming the ship's forward motion into a large, sweeping arc. Within a few seconds, they changed from bearing down upon the other vessel 
to matching her course side by side and just a few feet apart. That was when Ramsay leapt. Rathbone found it astonishing that a man of his stature could throw himself forward with such agility, but there was a cold fury behind the move that sent Ramsay soaring across the gap between the two vessels. The pirate closest to the railing found himself taking Ramsay's boot to his chest, knocked helplessly to the ground as the crew of the magpie's wing began to board. Mercia was next, taking a high dive from the rigging and rolling as she hit the enemy's deck and came up fighting. She pulled a slender blade free from its sheath and began to menace a young deckhand who'd been manning the cannons, but he clearly had no stomach for a fair fight and threw his weapon down almost at once. Mercia considered the quivering figure as he dropped to his knees before her, then cold cocked him so he couldn't cause any more trouble. Rathbone hesitated, not so confident in his own acrobatic ability, but prideful enough to try. His clumsy leap saw him falling just short of the other ship's deck, though his flailing hands were able to catch the rungs of the ladder that ran up her hull. Clambering aboard with his face flushed pink, he spared no time in taking out his embarrassment on the nearest pirate, the luckless man who'd only just picked himself up from Ramsay's first assault, found himself on the receiving end of a flurry of blows that left him dazed and crumpled in the corner. The enemy captain, however, had far more fight in her. Having leapt nimbly from the upper deck, she dropped down on Ramsay, staggering him and bringing her sword around in a blow that he was barely able to deflect with his own blade. You should have run while you had the chance, old man, she hissed, her eyes flashing as their swords danced. Now where's the sport in that? Ramsay shot back, edging closer and closer to the railing as each of the captain's blows forced him backward. Little by little, he was losing ground. Mercia was in no position to help him, for she was being terrorized by the final member of the ship's crew a brawny woman with a scarred face and a split lip who'd managed to knock Mercia's sword away. She was shrugging off all the kicks and punches that Mercia landed, and her grasping fingers were reaching for the smaller pirate's neck, twitching mere inches from Mercia's windpipe when the first gunshot rang out. Judging from the way the larger woman gasped in pain and clutched at her leg, Mercia guessed that Shan, standing calmly aboard the magpie's wing with a smoking pistol in his hand, had only been aiming to wound. Fine by me, she thought, and hooked her leg around the same limb, sending her opponent toppling sideways with a yelp and a stream of curses. Jumping down after her, Mercia followed this up with a vicious kick that sent the sprawled figure tumbling down the stairs and out of sight below decks. There was a loud crash, the sound of breaking glass, and silence. Drawing his own sword, Rathbone approached Ramsay and the enemy captain while Mercia crept toward them on the opposite side. Their battle was so intense, however, that he did not dare strike, lest he accidentally cleave down the wrong captain. Besides, the hulking man seemed to be enjoying himself tremendously. You're surrounded, Captain, Ramsay roared, pushing forward with a renewed surge of strength. Now it was his opponent losing ground, her feet dancing inch by inch across the deck until her back was against the railings. Surrender, and I'll show you mercy. She spat. Mercy? From the great Captain Ramsay, the brave pioneer who breached the Devil's Shroud? Pathetic. Real pirates never show mercy. If you're prepared to let me go, then you'd better learn to sleep with one eye open, because the next time I see you, I'm gonna slit. Ramsay swept a long, lazy arc with his blade. As the other captain moved her sword instinctively to parry it, his fist lashed out with a swift blow that caught her squarely on the chin, lifted her effortlessly into the air, 
and carried her backward over the railing. There was a splash and a scream cut short. Real pirates, Ramsay observed, would have seen that coming. With its captain lost and the rest of its crew defeated, the ship was a simple matter to secure. After some brief debate, the crew of the Magpie's Wing hauled Mercia's former adversary into the brig below decks, tied the youth who'd surrendered to a beam in the captain's cabin, and secured the final crewman in the map room. Separated as they were, it would be all the harder for them to conjure up a means of escape. We're leaving them to starve, then, Shan commented, keeping his voice carefully neutral, as he and the crew began to ransack the ship's supplies. Ramsay shook his head. We deserve a drink. So when we reach an outpost, we'll spread word about a fine vessel out here for the taking. Someone will pay us handsomely for her location, and then it'll be up to her crew to talk themselves out of trouble. Assuming some other ship doesn't stumble upon them first, Rathbone interjected, there are more and more of these cocky little greenhorns sailing around every day. Scowling. Mercia rounded on him. And whose fault is that, I wonder? Who could possibly be responsible for every lubber with a dinghy to their name finding their way through the Devil's Shroud, just as surely as if they had a map, our map? Rathbone's countenance darkened in return as he stepped up to her. This again? he snarled. And yet again, I say... If you're going to accuse me of treachery without proof, you'd better be prepared to answer for it. Just try it, you overbearing... Enough! Ramsay roared in a voice that shook the ship. The hows and whys don't matter anymore. We're no longer alone out here. So let's take what we can and sail on before someone else decides to pick a fight. Chastened, Rathbone and Mercia moved to opposite ends of the enemy ship and joined Shan in the hunt for anything useful. As he crossed the gangplank that was acting as a temporary bridge between the two vessels, a box of lead shot under each arm, Ramsay found himself musing on their journey to date. Almost a full year had passed since he'd stood in Rowena's tavern and boasted about his journey, a night that had unintended consequences. The tales and trinkets Ramsay brought back had compelled others to follow in his footsteps one way or another. For better or worse, the region beyond the Shroud was no longer a secret. The pirates back home had even given it an informal name, and though Ramsay had snorted disdainfully the first time he heard someone refer to the Sea of Thieves, the phrase had somehow seemed to stick. He supposed he should be angry at the rest of the world for intruding into what he'd once considered his own private paradise. Certainly Ramsay was furious the first time they spotted another ship, and he was ready to blow them out of the water for daring to approach him. But they waved a flag of truce and shared a meal. It turned out they merely wanted to offer thanks and a chance to dine with the famous captain who discovered the Sea of Thieves. He didn't know quite what to make of that. Since then, there had been unexpected encounters wherever they'd journeyed. They no longer enjoyed the luxury of sailing without a lookout in the crow's nest, as they had when they first arrived, secure in the knowledge that they were the most fearsome thing on the waves. Now, just like the old days, they had to constantly scour the horizon for distant sails, lest they be caught unawares. These constant distractions and the knowledge that a treasure left unclaimed today might be resting in someone else's hold tomorrow had served only to harden Ramsay's resolve. If these weren't to be his waters alone, then he'd damn well make sure that he was their undisputed master and that every other pirate knew it. He'd been relentless in dealing with those who opposed him and wasted no time before detailing his exploits whenever they stopped off at an outpost. Outposts? Now there was something Ramsay had never anticipated seeing out here, though he supposed it was inevitable. 
previously unspoiled islands had developed first small campgrounds, then crude wooden shelters, and finally boardwalks and buildings. Even pirates needed to make camp from time to time, and others would come along later to build upon what went before, using their unique skills to improve the place whenever they stopped by. There were at least two taverns in this region alone, both run by opportunistic pirates who knew about sugars, fermentation, and everything else that went into a good beer. These pirates had chosen to make their fortune by opening their doors to others, so that they might drink and relax without having to make the long journey home. He had even heard tell of a blacksmith coming to the region in the company of a crew who wanted to keep their weapons sharp and were willing to pay for the privilege. Before long, Ramsay mused, there'd be shipwrights and shopkeepers aplenty, all eager to hawk their wares to passing travellers and spare them the danger of the long journey home. All told, the increasing likelihood of bumping into other ships while out on adventures, coupled with his own rising notoriety, had led Ramsay to insist that they find themselves a suitable hideout. They needed a place where they could rest, relax, and repair, something that simply wasn't possible amid the hustle and bustle of an outpost, even if the folks around wanted to do nothing more than share a drink or hear stories. Mercia, true to form, had been keeping a careful log of everywhere that they'd visited and had suggested a number of suitable locations. The first potential hideaway they'd visited had been an innocuous island near the heart of the region, where a soft crescent of golden beaches framed a huge rocky cave with a fine sandy floor. It seemed like an ideal safe harbour, and so they moored the magpie's wing and made camp inside. Their revelry lasted only until high tide, at which point seawater began to pour relentlessly into the cave from all directions, forcing the crew to abandon their cooking pot halfway through a meal and paddle hastily back to the ship. Shan continued to insist he'd seen a shark snacking on their dinner as they sailed away. The second site, an imposing crisscross of rocky peaks surrounding a central lagoon, would have allowed them to hide the ship entirely. Shan even suggested mounting cannons on the high cliffs overlooking the bay's single entrance, allowing them to repel intruders. As they approached the island, however, tendrils of mist began to form around them, and a familiar sourness filled the air. They had to execute a swift about-face to avoid sailing any closer, and by morning, the ebb and flow of the Devil's Shroud had swallowed the island up as if it had never existed. Finally, Rathbone reminded them of the high-arched cavern where they'd spent their first night in the Sea of Thieves. The entrance was almost invisible, unless you knew where to look, he argued. And they knew from prior experience that there were no ghastly surprises awaiting them when night fell or the storms swept in. He called it a thieves' haven, and the others agreed. Shan in particular seemed to relish the opportunity to set themselves up a permanent home away from home, and by the time they set sail, had already dreamed up an extensive list of changes and renovations he wanted to make to the place. Mercia warned him not to get his hopes up based on their recent run of luck, joking that the whole island was probably an active volcano, or the moor of some slumbering leviathan, but not even she could put a dent in his unrelenting optimism. It turned out to be well-founded cheer, too, for the cavern was just as they'd left it all those months ago, with its hidden entrance and all. Even the remains of their first campfire were still largely undisturbed, though Shan expressed a desire to build a more permanent dining area of sorts, tucked out of the way where the smoke and the firelight wouldn't make their hideaway obvious to passing vessels. 
Mercia had bought into the idea of creature comforts too, though she had some very different ideas as to what needed constructing first. Bedrooms, she insisted, or at the very least, some sort of partitioned spaces were needed for some modicum of privacy. Rathbone, perhaps looking for a way to ease tensions between them, helped her wedge a series of bamboo poles across the openings of cavities in the cave walls and hang sheets of thick canvas from them, like curtains. When they found treasures, they had begun to set the smaller items aside, offering them in trade for those little luxuries that were slowly but surely making their way to the Sea of Thieves. Sheepskin rugs for warmth, boxes of candles, and sturdy chests and boxes to hold their belongings all came together to convert Thieves' Haven from a gloomy cavern into a place of respite for the crew of the magpie's wing. Only Ramsay had declined a bedroom of his own, pointing out that the captain's cabin was more luxurious by half than a rocky nook stuffed with gewgaws. Privately, the notion of spending too many nights apart from his ship felt deeply unsettling to him. It was back to Thieves' Haven that the wing sailed now, its deck strewn with everything the crew had been able to loot from the ship that had attacked them. Well, they may have been pretty pathetic pirates, but they certainly had some nice belongings, Rathbone commented, sorting through a collection of silks and fabrics. We should consider raiding other vessels more often. Shan pulled a face. Waste of resources, if you ask me. You have to spend half of what you earn repairing the ship. Not if you take them by surprise, Rathbone persisted. A sneak attack on a moonless night, with all the lanterns turned off, and they wouldn't even have a chance to retaliate. Mercia made a disgusted sound. We're surrounded by everything nature has to offer, and you want to waste your time squabbling with other pirates? What a waste. Everything nature has to offer, Rathbone parroted, unable to resist reigniting their earlier argument. Like what? Coconuts and pig droppings? Mercia shot him a withering look. Even you must have noticed by now, this place works differently. Just little things, like how much faster injuries seem to heal out here. They all knew what she meant, of course. Shan had slipped on some rocks and fallen almost twenty feet on their last excursion. He had gained a few bumps and scratches to show for it, but by the time they got back to the ship, he was back to his old self. A hearty meal, even something as simple as a banana, seemed enough to lift anyone's spirits. It was, Mercia reflected, privately, as if something about the region made everyone that much more resilient and filled them with a vitality that was missing back home. You got drunk more quickly, but hangovers passed faster too. Everyone seemed a bit stronger, a bit faster, could hold their breath a bit longer. The world itself seemed to be getting livelier too, with more storms and unexpected bursts of wind. Almost as if the place was reacting to them. Almost as if it was a little bit... Mercia grimaced, refusing to let herself think the word magical, because that was a slippery slope back to the bad old days of superstition and stupidity. They sailed back to the hideout in silence, each of them lost in their own thoughts, and Rathbone took his turn in the crow's nest. As they approached, though, he gave a sudden cry of alarm and slid down the ladder at speed. There's smoke, he said, in response to Ramsay's questioning look. Can't tell if it's coming from outside or in. Could have been a lightning strike, Mercia said doubtfully, for there had been no storms on the horizon. Ramsay said nothing, though his expression grew more ponderous by the moment. They maneuvered the magpie's wing in through the gap in the rocks, rather more cautiously than usual, and with their cannons primed, half expecting to find another ship lying in wait within the shadows of the cave. There was no ambush to be found, however, and they extended the gangplank 
just as they always did, stepping one at a time onto the rocky ledge. Ramsay insisted on leading the way into the caves where they ate and slept, his sword drawn and his teeth bared, though gradually they split up to conduct a more effective search. It was Rathbone's howl of anguish that sent the others dashing to his room, where the source of the fire had become clear. Greasy smoke was billowing from the smoldering remains of shattered boxes and crates onto which a lantern had toppled. They were the same boxes that had, until tonight, housed Rathbone's most prized treasures and the majority of his money. Together they doused the flames before rushing to their own belongings, leaving Rathbone to pick through what remained. Each of their quarters had been plundered, every room methodically and ruthlessly ruined, its contents ransacked. Supplies for the ship had been looted too, and what little had been left behind had been deliberately spoiled, burned, broken, or simply tipped into the sea. Someone, somehow, had found their hideout. Everything of value was gone.